from white to dark, therefore it absorbs. Uh, it absorbs heat, but also re radiates that heat. We know that the rest of the northern hemisphere in general has been warming. When you put warm in the poles against warm in the mid latitudes, what you do is you flatten the temperature gradient. And when you flatten the temperature gradient, those winds that go from west to east get weaker. And as they get weaker, that's the blue, they allow more air to go, warm air to go north and more cold air to go south. Those westerly winds act as a barrier between the cold high latitudes, the warmer mid to low latitudes. It's critically important. When they get weak, you get a lot more transfer back and forth. You look at Antarctica, just for a moment, the ozone hole in Antarctica has had a critical impact because in the southern hemisphere, that lack of, of ozone, only for a few weeks, has resulted in a small loss of heat over a place that's super cold already. It doesn't matter, it's getting colder. And we have, in general, warming uh, in portions of the southern hemisphere. But the net result is we have a steeper temperature gradient, very cold to warm. The net result is these westerly winds become much, much stronger. The north-south exchange of air gets weaker, and the net result is you create a barrier around Antarctica that prevents warm air from entering Antarctica. And these strong winds, as they blow across the Southern Ocean, bring up cold water, which is why the Southern Ocean is temporarily cooling, and that cold air fortunately absorbs a certain amount of CO2. How much, we don't know in the future. So, we've been working all over the world, these red dots, to study changes in atmospheric circulation systems where the westerlies have gone and other air masses. And in many ways, this story and a lot of what's happened to us over the last two to three to four years is about the jet stream. So now I'll begin to focus more on the jet stream in the northern hemisphere and make my way to Maine. As, I should have backed up here. If you take a look at this, uh, I guess not. If you take a look at that animation I went through too quickly, you would see that there are times when the jet stream pushes its way considerably farther south than normal. Why would that happen? It happens because the westerlies, that barrier, is very weak. The weaker that barrier gets, the more warm air goes to the north, the more cold air gets to the south. The summer sea ice in the Arctic may be melting, but there's still a lot of cold air up there, relatively. And as it turns out, the longer, the more embayed that pattern, based on colleagues at Rutgers, Francis, and Vavarus, they've demonstrated that the longer that lobe, the more slowly it moves, which is potentially why we get locked into these patterns on a fairly regular basis, and why they tend to last that long. So, what does it matter if the jet stream dips down uh, farther south than normal and has that pattern? If you take a look at Climate Reanalyzer, one example of what it does, this is a snapshot of one day this last winter, but in fact it applied to everything for the last two winters and much of the winter uh, days going back to 2012. And if you look at air temperature, Blue and purple mean cold. Look at that. That pattern of the jet stream moving down was bringing an immense amount of cold air down. If you take a look at the rest of the hemisphere, in general it's red and orange, meaning that it has been warmer surrounding this cold tongue of air relatively than it's been for, those, for that period of the winter in the past. You look at sea surface temperature, the Arctic Ocean has been warmer and in fact, the Gulf of Maine has been warmer. And if you look at where precipitable water, moisture available for storms goes, it's making its way farther north in the Pacific because it scoots up around the coast and around that cold air as the jet stream moves farther north. And in a place like Maine, it also scoots up around the outside of this cold air mass, providing a lot of precipitation which is exactly what you need when cold and warm air 
NASA's come together to create storms. So let's take a look at how things in that, in that system have changed, not just over a day, but over, in this particular case, the period back to 1975. And what you will see is that for the entire hemisphere, experience in the last roughly 30 years, a little less than a one degree centigrade rise in temperature. Variability because of natural processes, but a very definite gradient. If you look at the Arctic, a bit more shocking. Variability, but over the last 30 years, a three degree centigrade rise, which is big. And if you look at the northeast of the United States, there has been arguably from sort of minimum to maximum about a two degree centigrade rise. But so there's a bit of a slope here, but there's been tremendous variability. Very cold periods, very warm periods has a lot to do with the shape of this feature here. And just imagine, you're talking about the high latitudes which are most greatly affected and they're impinging, they're beginning to tell the story down at the lower end. First thing, just before we leave the Arctic, this is the warming of the Arctic in roughly the last five to 10 years. It has risen eight degrees Fahrenheit, which means that in the Arctic, the summer is now twice as long as it was five to 10 years ago. That's big, very, very big. Not here, but in the Arctic, which impacts us. And based on the best we can tell, this is the most dramatic change in the last 12,000 years. And because it happened in less than a few years, it's an abrupt climate change. So to think about the climate operating in this linear fashion is unrealistic. It can make jumps depending on where you are, and those jumps can impact other latitudes. These are the sorts of things that have been a consequence of Arctic warming. Not 100%, but if I had to give you a number, 75%, 80%. And if you knew to some degree, to a large degree of certainty, what the stock market would do within 75 to 80%, I'd be pretty happy. So what sort of an impact does this have uh, on natural, quote unquote, uh, catastrophes? Uh, quite dramatic if you look at insurance returns. Swiss Re and Munich Re are the two largest insurance companies in the world. They insure the insurance companies. They worry an awful lot about what they pay out. And if you look at the Northern Hemisphere, which is the upper plot here, very obvious trend in the payout, not only because population is increasing, more people, most people live on the coast, therefore storms are impacting them. And these are largely storm events. Look at the southern hemisphere, there's a bit of a slope, but pretty mild. So the northern hemisphere, and these are all normalized dollars, the northern hemisphere is being dramatically impacted uh, by increased frequency of storms. It's a great way to integrate over the entire northern hemisphere the effect of climate change. What do we have in store for the future? As we begin to, uh, as we look at the northern hemisphere where the westerlies are weakening, there's going to be more warm air making its far, way farther north, uh, red, cold air going farther south. It will leave some areas that did have water in the past, like the Middle East example, uh, in drought. Other places, interestingly enough, like the summer, the Indian monsoon will probably be pushed farther north than it normally is. In the Southern Hemisphere, the same, the, the story is different because the exchange of warm and cold air is not so great. Places like Mali. Now, Mali may not seem to have a great deal of significance to, to Maine, but it has tremendous geopolitical significance, as does Somalia, the Middle East. And a place like Mali, which is right in here, you take a look at the average, annual average precipitation in Mali over the, uh, the period 1979 to 2002. White means no precipitation. Only the lower fifth of Mali gets any precipitation, it's about one meter. If you take a look at what's happened in the last 10 years, that lower portion of Mali has lost half of its precipitation. It's a landlocked country, uh, the people have to go someplace when they have no water. 
Uh, other things are emerging. Other landlocked countries, uh, Tajikistan and Lesotho, happen to be the water towers for their area. Lesotho, in the midst of South Africa's drying, is very, very high, holds a lot of precipitation. Tajikistan has the largest mass of ice outside of the polar regions, and it's completely surrounded by <laughs> Afghanistan, Uzbekistan, China, uh, Kyrgyzstan, Iran, all of these countries that are dry. So you can only guess what's going to happen as the drought continues. 